Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here to talk about the topic this year, uh, protection for water resources. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I've got a PowerPoint presentation, but I should have a little bit of time reserved at the end for questions as well. So keep in mind any questions that you have. Um, it's kind of a complex uh, legal topic in a lot of ways. And so we'll see how we can navigate um, what is an ongoing um, and emerging controversy in the United States um, regarding water resources. All right, let's see here. Get the presentation happening. Okay, um, so yeah, welcome um, to uh, the topic lecture, um, the DDI topic lecture. Bit of an introduction here. I'm going to go over the resolution, um, talk about some key terms, do a little quick topic analysis for you. Um, but I think in your labs, you're probably talking about a lot about what the core affirmatives are. Um, obviously, we've talked about the generics and things like that. So this lecture isn't going to do as much of a description of those things, the debate arguments, but instead is going to focus more on the history and background of water regulation. I'll talk about the Clean Water Act um, and the definition of waters of the United States, which is the kind of purview of the Clean Water Act and really the core of it. Um, and then I'll discuss the Environmental Protection Agency as well as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, too. Um, and then some recent developments in water jurisprudence and recent developments in uh, some, some of the rulemaking authority that's happened at the federal level regarding uh, water resource protection. So just again, uh, to provide you with the resolution in case your lab leaders have uh, totally failed and utterly in their duties. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you resolved the United States federal government should substantially increase its protection of water resources in the United States. So a nice, succinct statement, um, fairly aesthetically pleasing, I suppose you could say a lot of better than some college resolutions in that way. Um, but I think offers some vagary too and how we might go about interpreting um, the resolution. So some of the core terms, in the resolution that have a bearing on how debates will happen. Uh, the first is its, which creates a possessive for United States federal government protection. Um, in particular, I think this is important for understanding counter plan competition um, and debates about the term its and its implication um, in particular will impact uh, states and state protections and the uh, state's counter plan, which I think is definitively competitive. Um, but then another counter plan, actually the counter plan that my group's working on, um, is the United States federal government increasing private protections or privatizing various forms of protection of water resources, um, which could be topical affirmatives. I think there's there are arguments to be had and definitions that are out there that discuss the difference between voluntary and mandatory forms of protection. Um, but it is, I think, a thriving area of controversy, whether the government should have a regulatory regime um, in place or whether there should be private protections. And so that is one of the central controversies of the resolution. Uh, protection, too, invites an analysis of controversy. Um, and the definition I have here is to cover or shield from exposure, injury, or destruction, um, which is a basic Webster's definition, but it does get invoked in various court cases that describe environmental protection um, and protection of water resources specifically. Um, a couple of comments or notes about the definition of protection here. Um, the first is that it's uh, possibly distinct from remediation or cleanup efforts. Um, and secondarily, um, it could occur prior to ecosystem degradation as one of the, I think, core elements of environmental protection that the literature discusses. Uh, that said, there could be arguments for how protection um, could include things like uh, wetlands displacement. So that's one of the options for landowners, basically, if they destroy a wetlands. Sometimes the EPA um, or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers rather will allow them to create another type of wetland environment. Um, things like the Endangered um, Species Act, too, will allow for habitat restoration in one area um, if there's habitat destruction in another area. And so protection um, invites a controversy about whether or not it has to occur prior to the destruction to be a cover or a shield or whether it could include remediation um, or cleanup efforts. And I think those are two kind of distinct AF areas um, that might be explored this year. So. Water resources, I've included, I guess, um, for water resources and in the United States, um, it's essentially, I, I think there are like consensus versions of definitions, and I don't have all the definitions here, but um, we can circulate those later if you want or have questions about it. Um, and then I think it gets like less consensus oriented, um, certainly for in the United States um, and somewhat for water resources as well. So when we're talking about water resources and the understanding of water resources, um, very typically, um, especially federal jurisdiction over water resources, 
Uh, very typically it includes surface water. So that's lakes, streams, rivers, and tributaries. Um, and so these things aren't ephemeral. They're permanent fixtures of the landscape, or at least as permanent as um, our human time scale allows. So not a like geologically permanent time scale, um, but these are water resources um, or water bodies that exist and will exist for the foreseeable future. Um, uh, groundwater resources are water resources that are underneath the ground. So aquifers, um, underwater rivers, um, things like that. Um, also a part of water resources, it's unclear whether or not the federal jurisdiction extends over those things. Um, and then last, um, another uh, area is atmospheric water. So there are some definitions of water resources that include atmospheric water. And so those could be um, in particular affirmatives that get used. Um, also, I guess coastal waters should be noted here. And I'll talk about that in terms of the in the United States uh, definitions and understandings. So for in the United States, most um, uncontroversial notion is the 48 contiguous states and Alaska and Hawaii. So that the land bodies that they encompass. Um, secondarily, the U.S. territories. Um, so Guam, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, et cetera. Um, third, tribal lands. So tribal lands are in the United States, at least in a geographic sense, although legally they are distinct um, domestic sovereign entities. And so whether federal regulation necessarily um, includes tribal lands is a point of dispute potentially, um, although native affirmatives will exist certainly this year. Um, Coastal resources or coastal and um, exclusive economic zones, so which is up to 200 nautical miles around the United States. Um, the inclusion of coastal resources could dramatically impact the direction of the topic. So, for example, if we allow for coastal and exclusive economic zone um, resources to be included in the United States, um, then I think the way that we understand the topic might dramatically shift. Um, it could include offshore oil drilling, offshore wind power placements. Um, it can include ports and port authorities. Um, it can include kind of um, dumping. There are a whole host of ocean um, affirmatives that um, dealt with dumping and the port and dredging, um, things like that. So those could be important elements um, of the topic if they're included specifically. I think coastal waters are likely included, um, EEZ, potentially not included, um, but there are definitions within the United States that do include them. So there could be topicality resources associated with that. And then last but not least, at least on my list, are military bases. Um, so I would say most folks are successful at excluding military bases, military bases, excuse me, that are abroad. So in Germany, Japan, South Korea, what have you. Um, but military bases within the United States or within the 48 contiguous states are very likely to be included in the topic. I included it last just because there is possibly um, an argument to be had for military bases or embassies um, that constitute sort of United States holdings that are abroad um, and not within the 48 contiguous states. But I think as a topicality matter, those have the most difficult time um, making an argument for inclusion in the topic that we have. All right. So moving on a little bit then um, to thinking about water and pollution and the historical orientation that we have towards those things, um, mostly within the United States, but there's a little bit of kind of, uh, kind of international perspective here as well. So for a very long time uh, within human development, waterways were viewed um, as a legitimate waste dumping site. Uh, so in other words, if you had a house um, or if you live next to a river, you would go up river for your drinking water um, and then you would dump all of your waste, including sewage, um, food scraps, agricultural waste, um, you know, whatever, if you had uh, herds of animals, things like that into the water. And then downstream communities would have to deal with the impacts associated with your pollution, I suppose, <laughs> um, for better or for worse. And this lasted for a pretty long time in terms of uh, government interaction with pollution and government interaction with this type of dumping. So in 1899, the Rivers and Harbors Appropriations Act included the Refuse Act, which was a subsection of the act um, that limited dumping that impeded navigation, um, but did not have a concern for pollutants per se. So in other words, there was this initial um, drive to say, well, you can't dump um, large things into the rivers if it's going to impede the ability to navigate those waters. Um, so waterways are designed for navigation purposes. And this is uh, in the United States specifically. Now, there is an evolution, though, where water pollution starts to become a problem for people and drinking water um, is, is one of the things that gets controlled 
and uh, regulate, regulated in the United States. And so the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948 um, is the first time that the federal government establishes a permitting process for dumping in navigable waterways. Uh, prior to this time, some states had some environmental regulations, um, but there was no attempt really to control water pollution at a broad-based level. There were a couple of problems, though, with the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1948. Um, the first is that it largely left enforcement up to the states, so it kind of just suggest, it suggested, for example, that there should be this permitting process, um, and the states were relegated to creating those permits and um, delegated to enforcing them as well. And so ultimately, it failed to address pollution in a broad sense. It didn't have a method or a mechanism for understanding the interconnected nature of waterways um, and the ways that pollution could impact um, other communities that were connected to those water systems. And so it wasn't until the Clean Water Act of 1972 um, that the federal government makes a serious attempt to regulate the uh, pollution that goes into the United States' waters. And specifically, the statute protects navigable waters, uh, which it defines as the waters of the United States, including the territorial seas. So territorial seas um, might be included in the United States there as well, um, but does not go further in defining what is, um, what, what constitutes the waters of the United States or WOTUS. So there are several WOTUS apps this year that deal with that definition. Um, the DDIX affirmative, which I wrote this year, deals specifically with some controversy about the definition of WOTUS. Um, and most of our recent developments in water jurisprudence are also kind of talking about um, and are concerned with specifically this definition and understanding what the waters of the United States constitutes. So the Clean Water Act also gave the EPA the authority to implement pollution control programs and standards for how much pollution could be put into um, specific waterways. So if a power plant is sited next to um, a, a lake, whether it's an artificial lake or um, you know, a natural lake, the power plant would have specific requirements on the amount of lead and mercury and other dangerous pollutants that could be released um, into those waterways. And section 404 of the Clean Water Act directs the US Army Corps of Engineers um, to create permits or a permitting system for filling or dredging in wetlands specifically. Um, I'll talk about the US Army Corps of Engineers um, later, also the EPA, um, and they do a couple of other things, but it's worth noting that section 404 um, is specific for um, wetlands and filling and dredging. Um, so the Clean Water Act also um, allowed, uh, or excuse me, required a permit for the discharge of pollutants from a point, point source into navigable waters, which is what the EPA um, was directed to administer, and then created assessment protocols for non-point source pollutants. And I'll talk a little about the EPA um, rulemaking process and how they go about creating rules um, and the process for those rule creations um, when I talk about the EPA. So the Environmental Protection Agency um, is one of two agencies that's uh, federally um, delegated authority over enforcement of the Clean Water Act. The EPA was established by executive order on December 2nd, 1970, uh, by President Richard Nixon. <laughs> so um, it's great. Richard Nixon did a bunch of different things that was important for the environment. Um, and, you know, some of those things that we, were, we, we don't really remember him for, but go Nixon. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that the EPA does is called the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or the NPDES, which is the permit process for point sor source pollution. So when reading evidence about the topic and reading evidence about the EPA, you might notice that there are lots of folks who talk about the kind of prohibition on specific activities. Um, there are some pollutants that are essentially not allowed um, to be discharged at all or under any circumstances. But by and large, it's mostly a permit system that the um, process goes through the EPA. So it's not entirely accurate to say, for example, that the EPA um, prohibits activities like pollution or the EPA regulations um, are, are prohibit prohibitionary, um, but rather they're a permitting process. So um, businesses, they do have to spend a lot of money on this. So that's one of the large controversies about the permitting system is that um, a business will spend a lot of money to get their land or the um, uh, pollution assessed by an independent you know, third party organization. And then those consultants will provide recommendations on the best ways that they can go about complying with current EPA guidance, which is contained in whatever the current EPA rule, um, which is there's actually an ongoing process right now for 
the EPA um, and the, the scope of the jurisdiction of the EPA and the way that they interact with um, the waters of the United States. And we'll talk about that. The Biden administration is kind of like changing the Trump administration's change to the Obama administration. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that you should know, though, about the EPA and the Environmental uh, protection agency is that it's an executive agency. So it's housed within the office of the presidency um, established by executive order and thus is in fact subject to um, some of the whims or changes in presidential administration and can be directed to create new rules or to end or eliminate the rules that it has that um, created in prior administrations. Got to take a drink of some good old H2O here. So, all right. Um, Let's see. So during those rulemaking processes, the EPA developed standards for non-point source pollution, uh, typically based on a parts per million baseline. So in other words, if a power plant or um, some other system is going to release pollution that, that isn't going to be directly um, placed into a navigable waterway, but would likely have an impact on water systems, um, then the EPA can create a non-point source pollution standard, um, which suggests, for example, like mercury dumping um, you can't dump a bunch of mercury like, you know, if you have a um, if Turner comes across several barrels of mercury, you can't just dump it out behind his house um, because it would be too much of a parts per million um, baseline that's being released into the environment. Um, and those standards are separate from the permitting process. Um, and so the EPA creates the broad based rules and guidance for clean water enforcement that states um, and also private entities must adhere to. And there have been different court cases expanded jurisdiction for uh, municipalities and everything like that. So even your local governments can't dump into waterways that are navigable without first going through the EPA um, permitting process. Um, and the way that the EPA creates rules is based on um, this kind of notion of a public notice and comment process, which is a 60 day notice and comment procedure when there's a proposed rule where the public um, or um, corporations that hire uh, people to act like the public um, will propose various comments about the rule. Um, usually, yet now it's on an online forum. It used to be that you kind of would um, send in letters or there would be a formal process um, where people would submit their comments. Um, and then after assessing the various comments from the public, they create um, the final rule. So there's a final rule that, that's then released in the federal registrar um, of official rules. And then typically what happens after environmental rules are passed is that a series of litigation occurs um, and then creates a number of different court cases and court precedents where people essentially fight or um, work through the different meanings of the rule um, in the court of law. Okay, so the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is another, um, it's not an agency, but another entity that is staffed with um, and directed to enforce part of the Clean Water Act. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is an engineer formation um, of the U.S. Army. So if you play any like first person shooters and there's like an engineer who like builds things, that's like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, just to date myself a little bit, I used to play Return to Castle Wolfenstein. So I was, you know, in like 2001 or whatever. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure those have come a long way since then. Um, but the engineer formation of the U.S. Army, they, you know, build bul bulwarks and um, they build roads and infrastructure systems um, whenever the Army needs to deploy somewhere specifically. So it's kind of like the logistical and um, construction division of the U.S. Army. And it's um, directed to enforce Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, which regulates the discharge of fill material um, into waters of the United States and specifically into uh, wetlands. And so um, it's worth noting that agricultural activities are largely exempt from this requirement, um, but that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers um, deals with a lot of enforcement um, in Section 404 for wetlands, because anytime there's a large kind of construction project that goes on, um, one of the things that they have to do is figure out if it's a wetland, figure out if it's going to impact the local wildlife um, and is a you know key habitat for um, any of the species, figure out if the pollution is going to um, seep into the groundwater or into the other surface water. Um, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers essentially assesses those projects um, and then engages in the same type of permitting process that the EPA does for um, point source pollution. And so, you know, if you interact with wetlands, then the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is going to be there um, along the way. Um, agricultural activities, though, are largely exempt from this requirement and have been exempt for some time, although there was a 2015 
um, Obama rule, I guess you'd call it the Obama rule, the clean water rule, um, which sought to expand the understanding of waters of the United States, which is the key definition of the section of the Clean Water Act and include um, some agricultural activities in the permitting process that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers requires. It's also worth noting that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for the siting um, and construction of and permits for dams, hydropower, flood control, uh, recreation systems, and then water supply infrastructure. Um, so in other words, if you have a large um, you know, flood control system, so like San Antonio, where I live, they get a lot of flooding because it's like kind of, it sits on a big aquifer, which has a lot of limestone underneath it. So the water just um, shifts around on the surface. It doesn't have a lot of drainage options, um, which is why it creates a, a, a large aquifer, which is good in some ways, um, and it's filtered water. But in other ways, for people who live there, right, if the water is just going to sit there, then you need flood control systems. Um, but when a municipality or a city goes about uh, creating that those flood control mechanisms, um, then they need to apply for or consult with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They need to apply for a permit um, and work with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the creation of those flood control systems. Um, there are some cities that are horrible at this, um, like Houston, Texas, for example, uh, has like very little flood control um, mechanisms in place. And then they don't have a really good um, you know, relegation of different types of um, different, you know, residential and industrial systems. So in other words, when it floods, it'll, it could just like flood the whole city. Uh, <laughs> and people saw that with like Hurricane Harvey. Um, and so there definitely might be some different affirmatives that are under um, dams, hydropower, uh, flood control, because those also, those all require um, federal intervention and federal permitting process that the states can't um, only, right, or solely um, implement. So I guess lastly, too, for water supply infrastructure, um, also another area the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers works with and thinking about something like climate change adaptation, where, you know, in California, for example, um, they disagree with how they might allocate water that um, would go to Nevada and, La and uh, Las Vegas. And so those uh, water supply uh, disagreements um, are mediated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Congress, and a whole host of other federal entities that impact um, basically the supply of water in the United States, the supply of clean water in the US for drinking. Okay, so there is some, um, I'm going a little um, faster here too, so we might have a lot of time for questions, et cetera, which I think would be great. Um, and, uh, you know, really get some of your thoughts on the topic and, and see what you're doing um, and thinking. But um, there are a couple of different Supreme Court cases that I wanted to work through um, in a little bit of detail here and talking about water jurisprudence um, in the United States um, before I move on to some of the more recent developments in uh, water uh, permitting and rulemaking that the United States has undergone. Um, so the first one of them, uh, the first Supreme Court case is the County of Maui versus the Hawaii Wildlife Fund, which was decided in 2020 by the Supreme Court. And it was a 6-3 decision in favor of a functional equivalent standard um, where indirect discharges were determined to require a permit if they were functionally equivalent. So it's a functional equivalent standard um, to a direct discharge into navigable water. And so the core controversy that surrounded um, this court case that was brought before the Supreme Court, um, it dealt with the County of Maui uh, reclamation, sewage reclamation water treatment facility. Um, they were taking in water, um, obviously, that had been polluted. And then, you know, you treat that water and you remove some of the pollutants um, as a water treatment or sewage treatment facility. And then some of the outputs include clean water, um, but then also a series of other pollutants. And the um, the, the treatment facility, the County of Maui treatment facility, was placing those pollutants into a groundwater system. Um, but that groundwater system isn't a navigable water um, because it's under the surface of the earth, or in this case, under the surface of um, the island. And um, what ended up happening with the Hawaii Wildlife Fund and a whole group of other um, non governmental organizations did is they first um, kind of like applied for um, a method of tracing the pollutants that the county of Maui was placing into um, the groundwater systems. So they said, okay, well, in addition to these pollutants, we need a traceable ink. It's a kind of like a UV reactive ink um, that would be obvious that where it came from was the county of Maui sewage treatment facility. And then what they ended up doing was tracing the pollutants and using this tracing method 
to find where the indirect discharge, because it wasn't directly discharged into the coastal waters of the island, because that's not allowed. And the County Maui Treatment Facility um, knew that that wasn't allowed according to the best EPA guidance um, and the Clean Water Act without a permit. So that, that would require a permit. Um, not that it would be prohibited, just that it would require a permit. Um, but so what they did was they put the pollutants into the groundwater system. And it was found that after a few months or after a few years, that those, pollut those pollutants started showing up in um, navigable waters or the coastal waters around the island because they percolated through the groundwater systems um, in the island and made their way to a federally um, regulatable waterway or the coastal ecosystems and estuaries that surrounded the island. And so the Supreme Court case dealt with whether or not the EPA had the authority to and the jurisdiction um, to cover those pollutants or whether the EPA's authority extended only to direct discharges into groundwater systems. Um, and there's some pretty funny uh, <laughs> decisions that were made here, pretty funny um, arguments that you can find in the decision talking about how um, basically the county of Maui's argument uh, resulted in or amounted to an idea that if you just built a little um, hill right next to a water body, you could just dump all the pollutants that you wanted to um, on the land and then you didn't have to worry about it. Um, but so, and in some ways this was a step forward from the, the water jurisprudence that, that um, existed before. And I'll talk about that with the Rapanos uh, v. United States decision from 2006. Um, but in other ways too, it kind of limited the jurisdiction of the EPA and the US Army Corps of Engineers because they, um, those entities had a broader interpretation in some sense of their jurisdiction that included not just these you know, functional equivalents, but also other um, hydrologically interconnected water systems. Um, so they didn't have to demonstrate functional equivalents. They could just regulate uh, groundwater systems or other ephemeral entities. And so it's unclear whether County of Maui includes ephemeral or temporary, right? So like a stream or a tributary that dries up um, after time, and we'll talk about the kind of difference between permanent and ephemeral, um, but it may or may not allow the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA jurisdiction in those cases. Okay, and then another really significant, this is probably the most significant Supreme Court case for determining and understanding how water jurisprudence has gone down um, in the United States, um, both for federalism purposes, but also for the enforcement of the Clean Water Act, and that's the Rapanos v. United States decision in 2006. And so for a little bit of background here, um, Rapanos was a developer, I don't remember his first name, um, in Michigan. And Rapanos was building um, a large housing development that included a bunch of different apartment buildings. And it was situated on a wetland. And a wetland is just an area that includes um, land and water, and it's kind of intermixing thereof. So it's a swamp. Um, yeah, it's like, yay, swamps. Uh, <laughs> um, the Everglades are good examples of wetlands. It includes different prairie areas, too, that are in Texas that are kind of like slushy. If you ever walk through them, you kind of need boots. It's like, a, you know, the mud gets really thick and um, sucks at your feet and things like that. Um, a lot of mosquitoes, uh, not very pleasant areas typically to be in, um, like a, a peat bog that you would find, you know, in Scotland um, or England or Ireland. They would be an example of a wetland. Um, Historically, the United States has not been great at um, defending or protecting our wetland areas. Um, but over time, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, basically through Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, has expanded its interpretation of what constitutes wetland and then what's required for a permit to change, um, to dump pollutants there. You know, the, they've expanded the definition of what fill material is to include various pollutants, et cetera. Um, and so lots of things um, typically would require a permit. So it was 2004, I believe, when Rapanos um, did not apply for a permit, um, despite the consultation with a third party entity that kind of suggests that he should. So he basically had an environmental lawyer tell him he should get a permit. Um, and then he did not get a permit. Um, and so he was ultimately um, given a felony conviction in criminal court for the actions of filling in the wetland. He put a bunch of sand there and then built an apartment complex on top of this wetland. Um, but then he he fought the civil penalty, which was going to be, I think, of several million dollars, which was the fine that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was going to impose on Rapanos um, and fought it through various uh, courts. And ultimately, at the Supreme Court, it um, arrived and it was a 4-4-1 decision. Um, 
I'm always happy whenever I see these Supreme Court decisions, they're like, you know, four, four, one. I'm so glad that debate judges are only, you're only allowed to vote affirmative or negative. Uh, <laughs> there's no like waffling, um, no plurality or concurring opinions because I can't imagine what the NDT would be like if uh, we had, you know, um, five judge panels with a two, two, one or um, seven judge panels with a, you know, three, three, one. It would be a nightmare. And the NDT is already uh, difficult enough. Um, but anyway, the Supreme Court's allowed to do that. Um, and so they did. And with a four, four, one decision, the plurality struck down the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So we had the, the conservative um, members of the court, which included uh, Justice John Roberts at that point. I mean, he was the chief justice. This was the Roberts court um, versus the liberal justices. And then Justice Kennedy, who was this, the swing justice for a very long time. Um, he was the one who kind of sat out. He concurred with the plural opinion, but then wrote his own different opinion. And so the plurality opinion in the in this case basically struck down the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers fine and suggested that the um, jurisdiction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers over wetlands only is it constitutes only over continuous surface water connections. Um, so the important part of that, um, well, there are a few different important parts. One of them is continuous um, and the other is surface water. So in other words, if water, um, you know, is seasonal, so if, you know, there's a flood zone and the floodplain that is full for three months out of the year, then ultimately the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, according to this interpretation, would not have jurisdiction over that area. So that's known as an ephemeral water. And so ephemeral waters were specifically excluded from um, the jurisdiction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, according to, this was Scalia who wrote the plurality opinion. Um, he's pretty funny too, um, even though, you know, he's got some crazy ideas about this stuff. But, um, and so this uh, surface water connection is also important. So even if there's a continuous groundwater connection, which is um, water that is underneath the surface of the earth, um, like I said before, so aquifers and underwater rivers constitute groundwater. Um, there could still be a continuous groundwater connection, but that still would not be enough to justify um, Clean Water Act jurisdiction. And the impact that this had, um, I'll talk about the um, this this decision by Scalia, and then I'll talk about Justice Kennedy's um, kind of like um, alternative standard or, or standard. I ah, should have done a little better job of uh um, <laughs> that, um, spell checking my, I guess, PowerPoint. But anyway, so um, what we have here from the continuous surface water connection standard is that states then are responsible for anything that the federal government doesn't have jurisdiction over. So it's significantly expanded the jurisdiction of state environmental protection agencies. And there are, you know, every state has their own kind of environmental protection agency and they do different things and have different standards. And some of them um, will interact with uh, continuous surface waters and some other ones won't. Some will um, have jurisdiction over groundwater and others don't. Um, but it's significantly limited the federal um, jurisdiction. Now, Justice Kennedy, though, even though he concurred with the uh, majority decision here, um, he suggested that there was a different standard that we should use in place of this continuous surface water connection that Scalia imposed. Although he ultimately agreed, he said, okay, well, you can use this continuous surface water connection standard just because I agree more with them than I did with the liberal wing, which was to just to say that the US Army Corps of Engineer, that their standard, um, which allowed basically like all hydrological interconnectivity in the United States, um, that that was the standard that should be used. And Justice Kennedy argued for what he identified as a significant nexus standard where water that had that was in a significant nexus with other water. So it could be groundwater, it could be surface water, it could be ephemeral or it could be continuous or permanent, that those waters um, were enough to justify the imposition of federal um, rulemaking authority and that the federal government then could step in and prevent the pollution or in this case, prevent Rapanos um, from building um, on a wetland. But the reason that Justice Kennedy ultimately concurred with and struck down the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers fine is he decided based on the facts of the case that Rapanos, that the water in question did not constitute a significant nexus with other waters in the area. So it's interesting because it creates sort of this case by case standard where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers needs to determine based on each case that there's a significant nexus um, for Clean Water Act jurisdiction over that case, rather than a rule-based sort of every wetland that exists is under U.S. Army Corps of Engineers jurisdiction. Okay, so that's a little complicated, um, but it is important to understand the way that the EPA 
um, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are kind of like currently interacting with federal law and the Clean Water Act on um, specifically waters of the United States. Okay. So then the last thing I'm going to talk about here are some of the recent developments that we've seen in um, the waters of the United States and the Clean Water Act and the EPA's jurisdiction. And they're really kind of like three most significant ones. Um, although I'll give you a little bit of background too, um, kind of like the prior history here. So after Rapanos, which was that Supreme Court decision, which did not leave a lot of um, regulatory clarity in place for state courts and federal courts, lower courts, um, because there was no Supreme Court decision that clarified exactly what the jurisdiction was. Um, and neither the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers or the Corps um, or the EPA kind of had clarity going forward. What ended up happening, this was during the Bush administration. Um, excuse me, I drink a little more water. Hmm. And the Bush administration didn't really want to push the issue one way or the other on Clean Water Act um, I guess, jurisdiction. And so they kind of just left it up to the lower courts um, and didn't really clarify. There was no big EPA rule um, or guidance that was directed at how to enforce this. So it wasn't until 2015 um, that there was the 2015 WOTUS rule, Waters of the United States rule, that's known as the Clean Water Rule. And this was the Obama administration proposed a rule that would essentially take the significant nexus test that Justice Kennedy had in the Rapanos decision and use that standard for developing the rule, um, but as well as some of the plurality opinion in Rapanos. So it took kind of both of the Rapanos um, standards and applied those to create a, a specific rule. And what they did with the 2015, um, the clean water rule, is the EPA suggested, um, they had a proposed rule and then a final rule. Um, and the EPA suggested essentially that there would be some waters that would be always controlled or um, under the jurisdiction of the EPA and the US Army Corps of Engineer. Um, and that some of those waters would include um, the, some of the ephemeral ones, um, tributaries and streams, et cetera. Um, and then uh, also streams and lakes, um, you know, the typical things that we think of, which are like the permanent surface um, connections. But then they kind of permuted Justice Kennedy's significant nexus test and said, well, there are other waters that based on a case-by-case -case standard, we can impose specific regulatory requirements on. And the permitting process means that the individuals who release um, or wish to release various environmental pollutants um, must go through the permitting process. And that's where they use Justice Kennedy's significant nexus standard to say, well, based on these you know, different case studies, then we can impose our regulatory regime um, in various areas. And that would include things like um, the wetlands that we were talking about, um, and then other ephemeral um, areas where water might dry up. So this could be dry creek beds. Um, and then the WOTUS rule too, the 2015 WOTUS rule, um, did not specifically implicate agriculture, but it also did not specifically say that agriculture was exempt from um, those possible impositions of the regulatory regime. Um, which it's worth noting, by the way, that uh, agriculture is one of the largest lobbies in the United States. And so their input and their feelings about um, these clean water rules are really important in the development of the rule and then this, the ultimate success of it. So unfortunately, the 2015 WOTUS rule faced significant backlash in the courts. I think um, 25 states or something, um, at least, um, they put in for, uh, they challenged the WOTUS rule in court, and they said that it expanded the jurisdiction beyond um, what Rapanos had allowed and beyond their capacity, right, to interact um, productively with the federal government in developing and, and propagating these rules. And so it was not ever really successfully implemented because it had been challenged in court for so long. And then, if you all recall, not very long after that, 2016, kind of, uh, you know, Trump won the election. And so there was the prospect for a new rule put into place very soon. And that was the 2020 WOTUS rule, which is known as the Navigable Waters Protection Rule. And the 2020 rule specifically removed protections for groundwater and ephemeral waters, and then clarified state authority over wetlands. So it basically retracted most of kind of the improved protections that the 2015 um, Waters of the United States rule imposed. Um, and it removed the significant nexus standard entirely from the assessment of the jurisdiction for the US Army Corps of Engineers or the EPA. And so if you recall, going back um, to my discussion of how these rules get propagated and implemented, the EPA or the US Army Corps of Engineers or both will propose a specific rule. And then there's a notice and comment period for 60 days before the rule is implemented. Um, and then after the implementation of the rule, there's usually a significant litigation period. And so 
the 2020 WOTUS rule was no different um, in terms of the litigation that has occurred. Um, and so it's been challenged in the courts by a number of different uh, entities, right, suggesting that it could cause significant environmental degradation and that it ultimately doesn't protect the water resources of the United States, um, but allows for pollution, um, specifically groundwater pollution and things like in County of Maui, where, um, you know, there was a indirect discharge of a pollutant into groundwater. Um, something like the 2020 no WOTUS rule may not even allow the federal government um, to have jurisdiction over that area. Okay. So that, what that brings us to finally is in 2021, the Biden administration has proposed a new rule and wants to use a science-based approach to Clean Water Act enforcement. Um, and they're leaving in place, this is kind of interesting to me, they're leaving in place the 2020 WOTUS rule for the moment, the Navigable Waters Protection Rule or the NWPR, which was the Trump rule, um, while they kind of negotiate the different rules that are possible for the Biden administration. And there, it seems like to me, uh, the way that Biden administration is undergoing this rulemaking process is that ultimately it's gonna result in a standard that's lower um, than the 2015 uh, WOTUS rule. So there probably won't be as many waters that are specifically um, allocated jurisdiction from um, or for the EPA. Um, they'll probably also retain the agricultural exemption, which is what the 2020 WOTUS rule allowed. Um, but We'll see where it ends up going, but the 2021 um, rule might include some of the ephemeral waters and then possibly some of the groundwater um, as well that the 2020 rule specifically excluded. So that's kind of like the current state of um, you know water navigation, or excuse me, of water jurisprudence in the United States, and a couple of different Supreme Court cases, et cetera, related to it. Um, and so I guess in thinking about the impact that this had and it has and the impact that these have had on um, different controversies in the context of the resolution. Um, I would say that it has been a very fluid controversy. Um, sorry, I couldn't help myself there. Um, but as a dynamic process, water law, it's kind of always changing and has been changing for several years now too. So it's definitely not a settled controversy at all. And some of the core controversies that are invited by these developments are suggestive of, you know, industry standards and industry development um, and how industries interact with these different rules. So those include things like the energy and industry and infrastructure for, you know, renewables, as well as um, classic, you know, fossil fuel based power plants, transportation infrastructure and transportation in industries as well. Because anytime you have to build something large and significant, whether it's a municipality, whether it's a federal system or highway, um, or whether it's, um, you know, local construction, they need to apply for a permit to the US um, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, it also implicates agricultural systems. So I think those are another um, areas of big disadvantages um, because ag uh, may or may not be included in whatever rule is happening now or potentially under whatever affirmatives are going on. In addition, all of the federal implications and federalism implications here um, are included kind of in the Supreme Court cases and also the way that the uh, WOTUS rules get implemented because historically states have had the bulk of enforcement power for the um, kind of like water pollution that occurs under most state waters. So um, the federal government's only jurisdiction has been for navigable waters really up until you know, kind of 2006 in some ways, but 2015 is really like the WOTUS rule that clarified that there were other state waters that the federal government was going to get involved in. So it's also a, a question of who has the authority, um, so which is a federalism controversy, who has the authority over water in some specific areas or others. So that's kind of like the core areas um, of the topic as it's implicated by um, these laws and also the um, Supreme Court decisions that have shaped the controversy to come. Um, all right. So I think, yeah. Then my last slide here is just uh, questions. And I wanted to make sure that we have time. Yeah, we've got about 12 minutes. That's perfect. I'm always thinking 10 to 15 minutes for um, questions from the audience. Does the 2021 WOTUS rule that Biden is making, like, does it have anything in it about wetlands? Um, so the 2021 WOTUS rule, um, I guess it's it the proposed rule. They haven't even really like finished the pro proposed rule. It's more like in the kind of like process. Um, the way that it interacts with wetlands, I believe, is that it uses um, some of the like some of a case by case assessment, but it's a little bit more like the 2020 rule um, in that I think agriculture is exempt from having to do wetlands protection. Um, that was really one of the big ones. So um, I think it's, it's preserving agriculture exemption, at least for wetlands. Which, which is a pretty big deal. So, yeah, Tejas, 
uh, what was atmospheric water? Hmm. That's a great question. I think somebody put that in the chat too. Um, so atmospheric water, oh, you put it in the chat. Excellent. Um, atmospheric water, I think it's just like water vapor and um, humidity. And so I'm, it's interesting to speculate about what the affirmatives that interact with atmospheric water might look like. Um, I guess regulating the release of water vapor, uh, maybe regulating the harvesting of water vapor um, could be kind of like a climate adaptation style affirmative um, or climate uh, modification. So geoengineering. Um, I know water vapor is a significant greenhouse gas. Um, so it could be something like that. Uh, yeah, Stephen, what's your question? Um, how does a water vapor app interact with things like tea in the U.S.? I mean, I think that's an interesting question. Um, and so it's like, does the United States, you know, is it in the United States and how far does, into the atmosphere does that extend? Um, my thinking on that is probably at least some of the atmosphere is within the United States. And if you were to do kind of topicality research on in the United States in the context of airlines, for example, I think there's probably, you know, um, jurisdictionally speaking, the U.S. I'm sure considers its airspace to be in the United States um, for at least, you know, several miles. So I know there's like at least one lab that's talked about probably writing an atmospheric water app. So um, yeah, other questions, let's see what we've got. So can you send the PowerPoint? Um, oh yeah, let's see, I can probably put the PowerPoint. Someone sent me a, uh, question about the PowerPoint. Let me close it and then I can certainly, um, I think, pop it in here. Um, let's see. Oh, I'll have to put it in a Dropbox or something. I'll circulate the PowerPoint um, to your lab so you'll have it available. Uh, yeah, Parrish, what's your question? Um, so you talked about like time scale and I was just wondering about like uh, in the cases of like, Sometimes if the U.S. were to have like temporary control of like an area, would that be considered like U.S. water resources or like because it's eventually going to and we talked about how like everything is eventually no longer going to be the U.S. It's like I, I just want some more clarification on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's interesting. I guess if uh, I'm not particularly familiar with this, but I'm sure there are some treaties, for example, between you know, like the United States and Canada or the United States and Mexico. Um, and I'm, and those I'm sure describe different, you know, water systems that either belong to the U.S. or belong to Canada and how we interact with um, pollution and pollution control. Um, I know in the Great Lakes area, for example, the United States and Canada have an agreement about what types of pollution are going to be released into um, those areas. I guess it's unclear if um, they have an expiration date. Um, you know, that could be an affirmative fairly interesting one probably which is just like we should just uh, re-invoke the terms of the treaty kind of like re-up our treaty um, with Canada on the Great Lakes pollution um, yeah that could be a possible affirmative certainly so I was mostly thinking it was it was kind of just a joke but it's like ephemeral waters right are those are temporary ones um, and so according to some of the case law in the U.S. Uh, ephemeral waters aren't covered by Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Um, but in a sense, I mean, you know, it's like how long is uh, Lake Erie going to be around? We don't really know. Um, so it could be an ephemeral water or not. Just, yeah, just interesting. I guess a puzzle to think about. Uh, Devin, what was your question? If the feds give like a point choice pollution a permit to pollute in a navigable, navigable water, can the state in which the river is located still not like allow that pollution? Sorry. So if, if uh, um, an entity wants to pollute into a navigable water. Yeah, and the feds allow it. Like the EPA allows it. Oh, still bucket. That's a great question. So typically in, in environmental law, um, the federal government acts as a floor, not a ceiling. And so really what can happen is that states can impose their more, they can impose um, more stringent regulations on um, the release of pollution. And so, yeah, so in this case, they might, um, you know, seek to get a federal permit, but they would also have to go through state permitting offices. Um, so, for example, California has more stringent regulations um, on the release of pollutants. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's kind of an area where so there's like different forms of federalism. 
Um, this is one of those things that's known as kind of cooperative federalism or dynamic federalism. That's what folks who talk about water federalism discuss um, because it's it, in its best sense, it's cooperative. Whereas like uncooperative federalism is when the federal government and the states like fight over some specific issue. Um, but water tends to be more cooperative or, or dynamic. Um, let's see. Tages, did you have another question? Yes. Uh, what was point source and non point source pollution? Yeah, so point source pollution refers to when there's an entity that is releasing a pollutant directly into a water source. And non point source pollution is pollution that's just released generally. Um, and so it's regulated based on like a parts per million um, system. So, like you can think about like an automobile as a kind of non point source, whereas like a power plant is point source. And you have to get a permit for point source pollution because those tend to be larger and more significant so in other words if uh um if i have like a factory right producing something and then mercury is one of the pollutants then there's only a certain amount of parts per million of mercury that i could release into you know local water systems so uh aaron yeah uh i had a question about the non-point source stuff so was there like ever like proposed legislation or like anything regarding getting permits for uh non point uh non point source pollution or was like this or was that like never considered ever well so i guess um you're asking is like is there a permitting process for non point source pollution yeah or like has there like ever been one you know not that i know of um i guess so it's difficult cuz it's like non point source pollution is basically like there's not a legal definition for uh, where it comes from. So it's like, it's just pollution that kind of like appears. And so, you know, when, um, I guess I used automobiles as an example, because so, you know, internal combustion produces a number of different pollutants. Um, and, you know, some of those pollutants are like sulfur, um, which can then cause acid rain or whatever. So if acid rain is flowing into the rivers, um, the EPA might be like, well, like, what are we gonna do about this? Where, you know, is this sulfur pollution coming from? Um, it's a non point source pollution because it could come from, you know, the concrete um, factory, you know, producing concrete or it could come from the automobiles. And so what they do instead is instead of doing a permit, they'll just regulate the release of those um, specific pollutants. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, yeah, other questions too. We got about five minutes. I'm happy to speculate on like the direction of the topic too and other generics that are involved and stuff. Um, I just wanted to make sure you kind of got a, a solid understanding of the legal basis for um, the Clean Water Act and everything like that too. So other questions that are not necessarily about the things we talked about too um, would be uh, appropriate or welcome. Um, what are like the the likelihood that like this topic is mostly like dominated by like K critical affirmative rather than policy writers. I would say, I guess it depends on, I think that's circuit specific in some ways. Um, I mean, I do think, you know, I didn't go into kind of like the different literature bases and things like that. And, you know, with a, with a shorter topic lecture, it's always hard to know exactly how much detail to spend. Um, I do think there is a healthy amount of good critical literature kind of just surrounding the different controversies that the topic invites a discussion of. Um, so, for example, you know, I listed tribal areas and tribal lands as one of the kind of in the United States um, possibilities. And so I think there's probably a pretty good um, natives AF, whether it's a soft left natives AF or whether it's um, a, a more, you know, far left kind of planless style, like we need to understand how natives interact with the environment and, you know, indigenous perspectives on land and um, reconfiguring our subjectivity towards water, like that type of stuff. Um, I guess I think the, you know, that water literature um, does lend itself towards critical approaches, whether they're eco-managerialism, um, things like that. So, yeah, I think, I think you'll see a fair number of critical affirmatives, um, you know, that are kind of like about or adjacent to the topic, but obviously not necessarily topic driven. Uh, yeah, Kevin. Um, do you think any portion of the oceans will be topical, like the EEZ or the territorial seas? Um, so, I mean, territorial seas is interesting because it's in the Clean Water Act and it says it's waters of the United States. Um, so it seems like those at least 
um, are, are probably topical. I've seen a bunch of different definitions um, that go each way. I don't know that the full EEZ will be topical. Um, I think you can probably win that it's the sort of like 10 mile or 12 mile nautical boundary of the United States. Um, I mean, people will probably fight the good fight though. I'm sure there'll be some like, you know, um, there'll be a, an app that says you can't dump, right? You're, you know, it's like cruise ships or um, transportation ships or whatever, what have you. It's like, there'll be an anti-dumping app um, for sure. And those tend to occur in coastal waters. Um, Let's see. Um, we have a question from Parrish. The Green New Deal is mentioned in the topic paper. Could you explain how it would be topical since it mostly deals with emissions? Huh, that's interesting, Parrish. Um, I guess I would see, see part of the Green New Deal, maybe it's like a section of it or a segment of it could be topical, which specifically deals with um, water supply infrastructure. So one of the elements of the Green New Deal is adapting to um, the impacts of climate change in addition to mitigating those. And that's like through infrastructural systems. And so as the United States goes about grappling with, right, the impacts of climate change, some of the things that are gonna be required are the construction of seawalls to protect coastal cities and coastal areas, um, the expansion and management of various infrastructure and water supply infrastructure around the United States, um, the negotiation of, different disagreements over water supply between states, right? Between Alabama and Georgia and all those things. So I think to the extent that the Green New Deal deals with those things, um, which is protecting and managing water resources in the context of increasing, you know, um, adverse effects from climate change, then I think those things are topical sort of on face. Um, whether or not just managing climate change as, an, as a whole is topical, I don't think so. Um, but that's just my sentiment on it. So. Nathan, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if you have any good like search term recommendations for finding mm -hmm. kind of solvency coverage for which counter plan. Search term recommendations for solvency coverage for which counter plan? Just state solvency, states counter plan. Oh yeah, state solvency, states counter plan. Um, I mean, you could you can put in like a state environmental protection efforts. Um, if you want like bigger stuff like interstate compact. That's always good. Interstate compacts. Um, you could talk about, um, let's see, just finding different state efforts and state-led efforts. There's also uh, laboratories of democracy. That's a good one. Um, innovation. Um, yeah, I think those are those are some of the ones that I would use for states. So, um, all right, let's see. I think, yeah, we've got, we maybe have a couple more minutes. We're also almost out of time here, but uh, Devin, do you have a question? Yeah, it seems like, at least in my opinion, it seems like most hats only detect water by effect. So what do you think will be like the bright line between what is and isn't effects Um, I'm, you know, and I'm not sure that this, uh, the topicality is the best route to attack affirmatives that don't affect water. Um, I kind of think that there will be a decent, just like if you have a water DA, so like the EPA administration DA, it doesn't even have to be great. Um, but you can test affirmatives based on their kind of like water key warrants. That might be a better route in some sense. Um, I mean, I guess it's like, it's not really water resource protection too. I would say protection of water resources has to be direct. Um, there's not a lot of language in the resolution that prevents, you know, kind of effectual topical affirmatives, but, um, it does seem like, I don't know. I, I think Klarman was talking about like banning ICBMs or doing the SSP or something, stockpile stewardship program where like nuclear waste might ultimately impact water. Um, I think you can target those kind of very specific things. Um, but then the problem is if it's like, if there's a method by which you could do that, that doesn't increase pollution on water, then that's like a clear circumvention argument like about the affirmative. And then in addition, a counter plan that says, well, we're just going to end the program, but not do it based on environmental justifications. Then at least in the context of the military, there are very good um, DAs to invoking or increasing our environmental protection that surrounds military activities. They've been, there are tons of different national security exemptions for something like that. So that's what I would explore with those apps. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm actually uh, working on the ICBM app. So. Oh, okay, cool. Well, there you go. So get that water key warrant down. Um, 
Okay, cool. Well, I think um, we should probably call it time because uh, we're we're out of time, and then lab starts here in about I guess twenty um, six minutes. So um, thank you, everyone, uh, for listening to the topic lecture, and uh, certainly ask your lab leaders um, more details. And I'll send out the PowerPoint too, um, so folks can have it um, that you can revisit it or you can um, use it for a lab. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.